name is Jacek. Uh, I work at Status. I do research there. Um, predominantly right now, one of the bigger projects we're working on is Ethereum 2 in the research team. We have a couple of other ones going on in uh, privacy, messaging, and working stuff like this. If there's one thing you want to remember about me, it's that I changed Ethereum 2 to Little Again. <laughs> there are very many happy people there. <laughs> I will actually go into the reasons a little bit why later on. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you want to follow along, the code we'll be looking at is online, the notes are online, or it's literally the size, so please don't edit them. Um, there's a couple of people I wanted to mention, like where this project is coming from. We were sort of sitting around and thinking whether we should start this like new fun project in NIM. And you know, as everybody every programmer knows that the very first thing that you should do when you're starting a project is like sitting down and like optimizing the shit out of it. <laughs> um, those of you that have a manager you call this a feasibility study. But anyway, this is what we did like over a weekend basically and that's sort of the basis of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, Yuri uh, a good friend of mine on the on the NIM team sort of started this idea that we could do contracts in, in this brand new language called NIM. And we were sort of experimenting with its status. It's a nice little language, it has very good template meta programming tricks, so you can like offer up a very nice um, environment for a programmer and then at compile time translate a lot of things to very efficient constructs uh, for the computer to execute. Right? Um, the other person I wanted to mention is Paul D on the he wasn't team. Um, so we post like we posted this thing on Twitter and then we started like in, uh, communicating and like, back and forth and we started sparring and going, hey I can cut up by the air and like oh wow I can cut up by there. So sort of together we came to um, where we will be going today with this thing. Um, finally we have Jacques which took up the project. Um, and it's actually a nice little interesting project. It's like a smart contract environment. We're experimenting with it to see what it would look like to program smart contracts. We're calling it the play for now. Um, something you should totally check out online. Um, or there's a presentation going on at the, or a workshop with the Embarks team from also from Status. They're sort of presenting a little bit about how you can deploy your contracts on UI and stuff like this. So that's the cool stuff. Um, all right, so where are we? We're talking about Iwasm here. Iwasm was developed like as an alternative for Ethereum 1 execution and maybe Ethereum 2 execution. And you know that goes a little bit back and forth whether that will be used or not. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be using a pretty old version of uh, Iwasm, the one that's targeting Ethereum 1. And it kind of defines like you know how the VM should work, what contracts should be able to do, uh, how to access the Ethereum one state, uh, a couple of system contracts metering, and it was sort of thought of as a gateway to, to, to Ethereum one, right? So a lot of the stuff you'll see here, if you're familiar with Ethereum one, you'll probably recognize like the names of the functions, um, how it sort of looks at. Uh, Ethereum state and so on. Uh, it's not really directly applicable to Ethereum 2. In Ethereum 2, we're sort of right now at the stage of exploring stateless models, and then maybe something like this will be available under Ethereum 2 in the form of an execution environment. Or maybe not, like that. Still being decided. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Like, Wasm, uh, one of the reasons why Wasm is interesting is because it's this like, uh, generic VM that's being explored for a lot of different uh, blockchains. So whichever blockchain you happen to be using that is targeting Blossom, the, the stuff that you're optimizing would be more or less the same, right? Um, and uh, I mean, why would you even go here? Um, well, on Ethereum, on, on any blockchain, right, storage is at premium. So if you deploy like a large contract, that's bad for everybody. It's bad for your own baseline in terms of cost. It's bad for your users because 
like um, they'll be paying lots of gas for for the execution. It's obviously bad for the ecosystem as well because you're just blowing the the state. Um, <coughs> how does the WASM work? Well, how does WASM work? Um, first of all, um, you have an environment in which your code is executing, like a little sandbox. Then you have your contract code on the one side, that's like the stuff that you write. And then the environment provides functionality from the outside world, right? Whatever that might be. If you're running this stuff, if you're running WASM in a browser, for example, that's going to be access to the JavaScript world and whatever um, the JavaScript code instantiating your WASM code has given you to play with. That might be the DOM, that might be like a UI canvas, stuff like this. Uh, if you're doing slightly more modern stuff, there's this standard interface called WASI, which gives you access to files. It's basically the interface is a little bit like what, what you would expect from your kernel library or your C library, right? That's the interface around there. So eWASM in particular uh, defines these functions, which are basically called data copy, for, for example, comes straight from the EVM, right? Storage is the S store, S load, and so on. So it has like a function for everything in EVM that is not present in WASM native, so to speak. And you get access to this from, from inside your little sandbox. So we will conduits to the outside. Uh, the contract we'll be optimizing today is like this really small uh, and simple WRC20. It was a challenge that the US and team posted a year ago. It's kind of like a little token contract, like a little transfer contract. You can see that you have a balance function and you have a transfer function, right? Uh, and this is basically an example of this new play contract environment that we're talking about. Like this is the pre-alpha, pre-pre-pre version. We're sort of experimenting with the syntax now. But if, if you look at Viper, it's a little bit similar. So you have like uh, functions then. You get an address, you return a U, like, like, like D balance. You can access <coughs> tables. Uh, you can do comparisons and checks. Um, and at face value, this is kind of like a simple contract. There's not much there. Um, but when we give it to the compiler, we'll go through this pipeline of multiple stages, right? Uh, so, we start with your code. Um, and in this case, this is the WRC20, right? And the first thing that happens is that it goes to the new compiler, and the new compiler expands it into like a key version, you could say. I was talking about macros earlier, basically at compile time, there's a bunch of code executed that expands it into print slightly more primitive uh, constructs in the language, right? And you access this library that we were talking about, the call data copy and so on. Uh, then it goes into the compiler AST, like that's just a standard compiler pipeline, right? Um, the language will do a little bit of processing, try to find like cases for optimization, it will pass it to LLVM. And LLVM, in turn, has its own intermediate representation. It will do optimizations. And then it will compile it to WASM. Now, WASM is this instruction set um, that is um, executed by the WASM environment later on. And there will be one more translation into the native instruction set of, your, um, uh, of, the, of the computer that you're running it on. Right? And that might be a phone, that might be your browser, right? on your laptop or whatever. And at every single stage when, when you're optimizing something, there's like opportunity to save either time or space or whatever it is you're optimizing for. Uh, today we'll be talking mostly about space. This is just because I want to limit the scope of this presentation. Yeah? Can you use like it wasn't in the last box like interchangeably with the eWASM, or, I mean, is this WRC20 going to be like eWASM contract, right? Yeah, so you can write your one, like, technically you could execute this code in the browser, or you could execute, like, you could write this by hand, starting here. <laughs> like, there's a lot of this, but I... Or, or like, is it, was it like eWASM, is it there, like there's, a there's no eWASM. Exactly, like, yeah, yeah. eWASM yeah. is, is just, wasm in the end, so... Right, right, yeah. okay. 
Yeah, so in Wasm defines like uh, basically the library and a bit of semantics outside of Wasm. Yeah, like an add-on. Um, so just to give you an idea of what, it, what this looks like, right? Um, the first stage of the pipeline, so we take your code and we sort of convert it to these low-level calls, right? And why would you use the higher level thing? Well, obviously it's easier to code in. But like the experience that we as, as the sort of uh, maintainers of this contract environment is that we take all these optimizations that we figure out and we sort of try to encode them into this translation, right? So that you don't have to bother. This is the premise of why you're using a high level language instead of a high call straight to the Muslim stuff. So you can see here the deep transfer function. Uh, previously it was just like one line here, it's expanded into like, all right, we're going to check if we have enough call data, we're going to get the caller, we're going to get the recipient, uh, and then we're going to copy back the value to the, uh, to the person calling the call, right? Um, the NIM compiler then compiles this to LLVM, and LLVM is this kind of generic IR for lots of languages. Uh, the reason why LVM does it this way is because they can then generically optimize on this like medium level abstraction. And it's looking even worse right here. It's starting to, uh, you're starting to get really hairy, right? So you, you allocate memory, uh, you're offsetting pointers into these structures, you're, you're doing tail calls, stuff like this if you recognize them uh, from your computer science class, right? Otherwise, like, this is starting. Like here you have to have a little bit of specific knowledge to understand what's going on, right? Um, and finally we have the step where LLVM takes this and uploads it to Wasm. Uh, LLVM, register-based, Wasm, stack-based, this is like two ways of looking at the same problem. This mismatch uh, is one of the reasons why some people think it's better not to go through LLVM and you create like Wasm compilers because obviously in every translation step you lose a little bit of efficiency. And that's true when you're going from the high level constructs to like the medium level ones, and every time you take a step like this, you just lose a tiny little bit. But we'll be exploiting some of these things that we know are losses, and we'll try to take them away, all right, by, by being smart about uh, what we're doing. Um, our starting point is roughly at four Four, four and a half kilobytes. If you take like that smart contract code, um, you'll end up at four kilobytes. And there's this tool called Twiggy, uh, which gives you like where the size is spent. Immensely useful. So you can see that like, all right, just the fact that we're saving these long function names, that we had like the do transfer, takes up a lot of space in your contract. So the first thing you want to do is like make sure that you're calling your tools correctly. Like you want to have tools that like strip away all this stuff um, and try to do some basic optimization. So just by using the compiler and like calling it with the optimization on, we can bring it down to, to roughly a third. Um, but obviously, like when you're looking at the code, you, you can't really tell what's going on anymore. Like, but the compiler doesn't, or, or really the execution environment, doesn't really care for your long nice function names. It just needs to know where the code is. Uh, the second thing is that like, when we started coding this, like, we were thinking like, all right, let's do 128, 128 bit integers. And this is like, uh, this is an instance of really not understanding your problem because uh, the challenge was for 64-bit integers, and like, we wrote this with 128-bit integers because that's what you often use in Ethereum uh, for storing weight values. Um, Wasm in particular has issues with this. There's no add with carry operation, for example. Uh, so when you want to add two 128-bit numbers together, you have to do it piece by piece, and then you have to do a little um, branch to see if you overflow it, and then you need to add that to your um, number, and it becomes like a fairly big um, piece, chunk of like raw code. Uh, so we thought, that, all right, 
Fine, let's skip the 128-bit stuff. Let's move to 64-bit values throughout. There we go, 100 bytes of savings roughly, right? I thought it would be more. Um, I really thought it would be more because like, these admin carries and so on, they usually tend to take up a lot of space if you do them uh, with libs. Uh, but it turns out that uh, we met the optimizer. And what does the optimizer do? Well, the optimizer looks at your code and tries to make it better in various ways, right? And one of the functions that we have is this big engine thing, which if we implement it in a bit from, like in a, by following the bits, if you don't have access to an instruction that does this for you, this is what you need to do with the basic operations, right? You need to do lots of ands and shifts and stuff. But LLVM is so smart that it recognizes this pattern and turns it into a B-swap intrinsic. B-swap, which is like what the swapper of bytes, is one more thing that you don't have available in Muzzin. Uh, but when we take the step from WASM, uh, from LLVM to IR, LLVM does not know about this really. So it thinks that this B-swap call is very cheap and inlines it. Okay. On x86, that makes perfect sense. It's one instruction thing. Um, and you really don't want to be making a function call to access this one instruction. Was it not so? All right, let's turn off inlining for this particular function and suddenly look. We lose uh, 400 bytes, 350 bytes, something like this, just by giving the optimizer this hint. We know something better than the optimizer, right? We're turning, turning off inlining for this one particular function. Um, moving on. We have the language itself, right? Uh, NIM is it's kind of like a safe language. When you initialize things, it tends to like to zero, put them to zeros, like all the values. Knowing this, uh, we haven't really told NIM that this call data copy function will overwrite the data. So what NIM does here in this instance is that it first writes 32 zeros to this array that we'll be using. And then we overwrite it with the data that we're copying. So in order to know that you have to do these things, you can go back and look at the assembly, like the WASM output, and see what's going on, and you're thinking like, oh, look, it's writing lots of zeros, and then we're overwriting those zeros um, with data. All right, what do we do? Well, we turn off the zero initialization, we write 20 bytes of address, and then we zero the rest. Simple optimization, right? 200 bytes. You have to know your library. Like when you're using a library like eWASM, you have to really understand what the different functions do. In this case, <coughs> naively, we thought we'd be safe. We'd write some extra safe code here. We check the call data say, do we really have 24 bytes or not of call data? Like, did they really pass in enough data for us to run this function as they, as they wanted us to? All right, let's check and revert. It turns out that the call data copy, if you just call it, uh, and give it like, all right, I want the last 24 bytes. <coughs> if there's not 24 bytes available, um, it will revert. It will do this work for you. S which means basically that you can just remove this and, and the program will function exactly the same. The optimizer. Well, um, the optimizer works by looking at your code and trying to figure out the best way to schedule it, but it doesn't really understand all of your functions. So, but what do we know? Well, we know that if we're doing the transfer, we're removing uh, the value from the sender and we're giving it to the receiver. In the original code, we were first loading all the data doing the transfer and then saving all the data. But instead, we can recognize that like, we don't need all this data available at the same time. We can load the sender's value, <coughs> subtract it, save it, and then we can load the receiver's value, add it, and save it. And this means that we don't have to use 
memory uh, for both these operations. Um, so, what's left here? Well, oh no, I skipped one. Yeah, that's it. What's left here? When we've done all these optimizations, like we have your contract code, and then we have this big engine optimization, and then we have a bit of craft that we can't really get rid of. Uh, this is the way that we tell our contract about the environment. Right? It's like a fair bit of space. So if you listen to Paul's uh, presentation, you would know that we can also compress your contract using like ZLib or something, and you can save a little bit more. Um, but the quick summary here is that like know every step of your of your pipeline, right? You can use the knowledge across the board. Yeah, uh, yeah. all right. All right, there we go. <laughs>